Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today in our 444th episode, we're going to be talking about dinosaurs in the Badlands. And by that we mean in volcanic environments as well as in the desert. And that's because Prehistoric Planet 2, Episode 2, is about the Badlands. I think it's also kind of fitting because 444 is an extremely unlucky number in Chinese. Oh, so, you're saying the Badlands is unlucky? <laughs> I mean, it's got bad in the name. It's not great. <laughs> <laughs> we also have an interview with Mike Gunton and Tim Walker, who are the executive producer and showrunner, respectively, for Prehistoric Planet 2. And we have Dinosaur of the Day, Isisaurus, which shows up in this episode of Prehistoric Planet. <laughs> not surprisingly. But before we get into all that, we want to thank some of our patrons. And this week we have three new patrons to thank. They are LIO, also Transylvanosaurus King, and Paul M., who just upgraded to a shout out tier. Awesome. And then rounding out our shout outs, we've got Chris, Resident Zeno, Stefan, Albertosaurus, Ray, Adilosaurus, and Eric. Yeah, thank you so much for being a part of our dino community and supporting our show. We also want to give a big thank you to Drew slash Scooter from Sleep With Me, the podcast that puts you to sleep. He recently sleepified one of our episodes. It's the one about how dinosaurs evolve flight. And in case you're not familiar with Sleep With Me, it's a bedtime story podcast to help you fall asleep. It's been around since 2013, and it combines the pain of insomnia with the relief of laughing. <laughs> So in our Sleepified episode, which is out now, he finds a really fun, entertaining way of connecting Bette Midler, eagles, and dinosaurs. <laughs> and if you make it far enough into the episode without falling asleep, there is one line that made me laugh out loud. Uh, I'm not a peacock, I'm an ostrich. So, Easter egg for you. <laughs> you can check it out now by subscribing to Sleep With Me or going to the website at sleepwithmepodcast.com. So now, as promised, we'll talk about dinosaurs in the Badlands, specifically the ones that appear in Prehistoric Planet 2. I was thinking about, these are not the typical Badlands that we talk about. No, because according to Prehistoric Planet 2 terminology, Hell Creek, which is the most popular Badlands I know of in terms of dinosaurs, is considered a swamp because we're talking about what it was when we were in the Cretaceous, mm -hmm. not what it is in today's world <laughs> yes because <laughs> in general there are a lot of band lands which are good for finding dinosaur fossils in because as han Suze was saying in a recent interview deserts are great because there aren't any people in the way there's no vegetation in the way it's a great place to find any kind of fossil mm -hmm. so badlands are a very popular place to go prospecting but back in the mesozoic there were still badlands they had fossils too the dinosaurs just weren't prospecting yes <laughs> <laughs> So since this is all about episode two of Prehistoric Planet 2, there are more spoilers in case you haven't seen it yet. Definitely recommend watching it. Yes. But we will explain the situation. So even if you don't see it, you'll know what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. And as Garrett mentioned at the beginning of the episode, it's about volcanoes and deserts. Specifically, it's the Deccan Traps and the Nemet Formation. So starting with the Deccan Traps, we've mentioned these before, but I don't know if we've ever really explained in depth what the Deccan Traps are. They were formed by absolutely colossal volcanic eruptions that lasted for hundreds of thousands of years in what is now India, sort of in the western part of India. It's intense. Yes. They're called a trap in this case, not because they like trapped things or anything like that. It's a geologic term, which just refers to a dark volcanic rock formation. So it, you could think of it as like a Deccan igneous rock formation mm. is basically what it means it's not as catchy no it is a really enormous rock formation it's one of the largest volcanic rock formations anywhere in the world and it was discovered quite a while ago because you know it's like black and there's also some really cool green sort of gemstone like glassy rock stuff going on so it, it stands out in the environment because Sort of like the Badlands, you know, it's just a noticeable <laughs> geological feature. The Deccan Traps are a flood basalt, and flood basalts aren't formed by big explosive eruptions, like is what we usually think of when we think of volcanoes. It's more of a long, slow ooze. 
It's more of like a Hawaii or Iceland most of the time. Iceland sometimes gets a little explodey. But mm. Oh, we'll talk about that later too. <laughs> yeah. Usually it's more of like a slow ooze. So that's what this kind of volcanic eruption is. Flood basalts can flow for hundreds of kilometers or hundreds of miles and form really thick layers of lava. I heard one description of it as sort of like a lava tsunami or like a literal lava flood, Oof. which is a good description of it. Although tsunamis also are pretty misunderstood because tsunamis don't usually come in like a huge wave like they do in movies. Mm -hmm. It's more of just a tide that keeps coming in and keeps coming in and keeps coming in. It's a strong tide. It is, but it, it's more of like it just rises up and just like keeps rising. Mm -hmm. If you're right at the shore, obviously the waves will crash just like they do from any kind of tide coming in. But in the same way, this is like lava that just sort of keeps going and going and going. I saw one estimate of a lava flow that went for about 500 kilometers, and they estimated it went about three and a half kilometers an hour, Ooh. which isn't that fast, but it's also not that slow. <laughs> yeah, you know? like if you're trying to outrun it. Yeah, you do have to move. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can't, you don't have hours to wait, like some of the ones you see in Hawaii where they're just like barely moving. So the Deccan traps formed in this way over and over again, many, many tsunamis over time sort of building up on top of each other because unlike a tsunami where the water goes away after the fact once the lava flows into place it solidifies into rock and then when another tsunami comes over the top it just keeps layering up and building up and so at the end of it the Deccan traps are over a mile thick they're i think 6600 feet thick in some places <laughs> which is pushing like near two kilometers incredibly thick piece of rock Current estimates are that the eruptions probably started just before dinosaurs went extinct and ended somewhere between 65 and 66 million years ago, uh, sort of lasting on the hundreds of thousands of years time frame. Mm -hmm. There's a good chance that the majority of the eruptions happened after dinosaurs had already gone extinct, but we do think that they had started before they went extinct. One hypothesis is that the Chicxulub impact actually caused more eruptions at the Deccan Traps, and the Deccan Traps are basically on the opposite side of the Earth from where the Chicxulub impact happened, and that might be analogous to sort of like hitting the bottom of a ketchup bottle. Like the Chicxulub meteor is your hand, the ketchup bottle is Earth, and the Deccan Traps are the nozzle on the <laughs> other side, sort of like squirting out the lava. <laughs> Interesting. We saw we I think we mentioned that when it was described a while ago. I don't know how popular this hypothesis is, but it is a hypothesis. It goes back and forth a lot between you know, did the Chicxulub impact affect the Deccan traps or was the Chicxulub impact even the main thing that caused the dinosaurs to go extinct or was it the Deccan traps? There's a few papers that have come out recently discussing yes. these things. Yeah, yeah. It is a very popular topic of study and a very difficult one to get to the bottom of because we know they happened around the same time and we know before there were dinosaurs and after there weren't, but exactly how those two impacted the dinosaurs is difficult to figure out. How did that Chicxulub impact impact things? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but whatever the cause of the Deccan traps, if it was impacted by the Chicxulub impact or not, they ultimately ended up covering 0 0.58 million square miles, mm. which is about half the size of India. The eruption rate probably contributed to climate change and cooling or dropping of temperatures of about 2 degrees Celsius or 4 degrees Fahrenheit. At least that's according to one study. It may have caused a drop in temperature because of a large release of sulfur dioxide, which reflects sunlight, basically the opposite of carbon dioxide. Of course, it may have also released carbon dioxide, which could have warmed the atmosphere, as others have suggested. And in that case, it would have actually meant that the Deccan Traps helped make the Earth more habitable for dinosaurs in the face of cooling caused by the Chicxulub impact. So there is even one hypothesis where it's like the Deccan Traps were a benefit that sort of ameliorated the effects of the Chicxulub impact. Hmm. So it could be making it worse. It could be not really affecting it that much, or it could be making it much better. It's <laughs> like all the camps still have good points to make at this point. And another interesting thing is that dinosaurs survived many other large volcanic eruptions, 
which I'm going to talk a little bit about in the fun fact. So it's not just like volcanic eruptions are always bad for dinosaurs. Mm -hmm. Now, the other big part of episode two is the Nemet Formation. And we've talked a lot about this formation on our show, so I'll keep this brief. It's in what's now the Gobi Desert in Mongolia. It has a relatively dry climate with hot summers and cold winters, and it was home to a lot of animals. Fish, shrimp, turtles, crocodilians, mammals, pterosaurs, and of course, a whole bunch of dinosaurs. Actually, some of the coolest dinosaurs, in our opinion, like Therizinosaurus. Yeah. I know a lot of people have described the Namek Formation as relatively similar to how Mongolia is today, where there is desert, but there are also areas with rivers and there are some forested areas and sort of a, a combination of things. And it would have been hot in the summer and cold in the winter. I think it's always kind of cool that it's actually kind of similar because so many of the other places around Earth are very different. Mm -hmm. But in this case, it's, it's actually kind of similar to how Mongolia is now. And it's where some very famous dinosaurs have been found. You've got Tarbosaurus, which is like the equivalent of the Asian T-Rex, mm -hmm. or what is now Asia T-Rex. Then there's the Oviraptors, which are, you know, we talk about how misunderstood they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, Velociraptor too. You also get Alvarosaurus and some Ankylosaurus. Mm -hmm. There's lots of good stuff in the mech. They cover a lot of them in prehistoric planet too. <laughs> <laughs> to be specific. Mm-hmm. So again, I want to talk about the filming locations and the animals associated with them because they went to some really cool sites. So the episode starts with you see a herd of all-female Isisaurus sauropods, and they're walking past lava because we're in the Deccan Trap <laughs> while yep. it's actively erupting, and they're going to their nesting site. And both Garrett and I, I think separately, we had the thought, these are very land before time vibes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Because they talk about, oh, they have to get up this mountain and they're trying. It's like, just like in Land Before Time, they're going to cross these volcanoes. There's a lot of volcanism in Land Before Time. Mm -hmm. And it's a lot of like, oh, if they can just make it beyond this. And also it's sauropods like Land Before Time. It's just, yeah, very Land Before Timey. Yeah. So the crew went to three different sites in Iceland to film these scenes. And uh, my Icelandic is not great, so please forgive my pronunciation. One of the sites was the uh, Gradalsfjall volcano. It erupted pretty recently in 2021 and 2022, but it's currently inactive. You can hike there if you want. You can hike around the eruption site, and it's about 4.4 miles or 7 kilometers each way. There's three different routes to choose from. It's a rocky terrain with mossy areas. You do have to watch out for rain fog and cold temperatures. And maybe an eruption. <laughs> maybe. Well, apparently it's currently inactive, but the lava from the 2021 and 2022 eruptions are still hot and it's dangerous to walk on. <laughs> But you can take guided tours or helicopter flights over the volcano. <laughs> I watched a documentary about a group of people who got stuck on an island when it erupted, and I have no interest in this now. <laughs> <laughs> That's fair. But what was interesting is the rocky terrain with the mossy areas, they really showed that in the episode. You know, one of the things we've talked about is what is real versus what CGI, mm -hmm. even the environment <laughs> shots. <laughs> yeah. It's cool, too, that they used Iceland because it is a similar sort of, not maybe not necessarily flood basalt all the time, but that more oozing sort of eruption mm -hmm. that they had at the Deccan Traps. Well, apparently they did want to go to Hawaii to film for the volcano scenes, but because of COVID, it was too hard to access the island. And apparently they were also disappointed that the volcano in Iceland stopped erupting. <laughs> they were right about to film it. Yeah, exactly. And assistant producer Annie Bates said, quote, the day before we arrived in Iceland, the volcano decided to stop erupting. <laughs> but luckily, she said they filmed the volcano erupting when they were scoping out the location earlier. So they still got what they needed. Yeah. Good thing they brought good cameras with them for those <laughs> scoping out shots. Yes. I guess if you're going to a volcano, it's like, well, we might as well right. make sure we can get a good shot as long as we're there. And apparently that volcano had been dormant for like 6,000 years before 2021. Oh, wow. All right. So the other location in Iceland is the Hever geothermal area. And you can see a lot of boiling mud pots and sulfur crystals. And there's also a hiking trail. 
Oh, I remember the boiling mud. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just think it's really interesting that you can hike all these places. Mm -hmm. And then last, they went to the Haverfell Crater, which you can also hike. You can walk around the rim. It, the volcano erupted about 4,500 years ago, and the explosion crater is about 1,300 feet or 396 meters high. So these are for all the deck and trap scenes, which include the icy source sauropods hatching, because we mentioned it was the female herd going to their nesting site, and you see the sauropods hatching. I assume that crater is the nesting site. That's what it sounds like. I think so. That's what it looks like in the show. And then the deck and trap of these sites is also where we see Rajasaurus. It comes in later. It actually snaps up some baby Isisaurus as snacks. But some of the babies hide in cracks in the lava, which I thought was pretty clever. Mm hmm Always burrow. Yeah. That's the strategy. The Isisaurus babies also have keratin on their beaks for when they're hatching. Yeah, I had to check if that Titanosaur embryo with the pointy beak was an Isisaurus. But it wasn't. Mm. It was just called a quote unquote titanosaurian embryo. We don't know enough to know for sure what it is. No. And it, it wasn't from India either. It was from Argentina. Mm. Or yeah, I'm pretty sure it was Argentina. It was in South America. And they called it a horn. And they made this paleo art of a serious horn sticking out of its face. Basically where an upper lip would be on a mammal. It looks like a crazy, huge, weird, pointy upper lip. Do you remember those pictures? Yeah. The prehistoric planet little beak shaped things were much cuter <laughs> they didn't point out as much they were more down in like a more normal beak place but yeah it was pretty cute they were cute babies the babies also call to each other while they're still in the egg to help them with synchronizing hatching yeah we know that modern bird embryos can communicate with each other while they're still inside their shells so that's completely believable mm -hmm. and after they hatch the baby isosaurus they eat their mother's dung. Yeah. Yeah, that's called coprophagy. And lots of animals do that. A lot of them, in fact, eat their mother's poop. That includes elephants and koalas both do that. Presumably, it's to get their parents' gut bacteria to get their digestive system going. But it's hard to know how nutritious a sauropod poop would be to its young. Some smaller animals eat their own poop to get a second chance at the nutrients. For example, hamsters. Mm. That's a pretty well-documented one since a lot of people have pet hamsters. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with the enormous digestive system of a sauropod, maybe they would have been better at absorbing nutrients or might not have been as much available in their poop. It's hard to say exactly. Mm -hmm. But it is possible that they could have had a special poop just for their future babies <laughs> or like, you know, ate a specific diet right beforehand or what. also parents do all sorts of interesting things right along the time they give birth. Hamsters don't always eat their poop. They only eat specific nutrient dense types of poop. And apparently even elephants only manage to digest about half of the plant matter they eat. So there's still a decent amount of undigested food available. But it's mostly small invertebrates like flies and beetles that usually go after it. Hey, it doesn't go to waste. Nope. Although, again, their babies do sometimes eat it too. Yeah. So we learned some of the stories behind creating these scenes. And apparently, speaking of poop, <laughs> to simulate Isisaurus, according to some press notes that we got, quote, Crew members collected bin bags of horse poop whilst being mobbed by the horses who were very keen to get paid in apples. On set, someone then had to be brave enough to meld the dung into dinosaur poop shapes. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't sound like a very fun job. No. <laughs> Although horse poop isn't that bad. No, but having to shape any kind of poop <laughs> just doesn't sound great. It's not ideal, though. <laughs> In the scene where the Isisaurus are hatching, they dug a trench under the nest, and then one person laid in the trench, and they pushed a 3D model of the hatchling through the volcanic sand to simulate them hatching. <laughs> That's fun. I always love when there's a person hiding and like sort of manipulating some kind of puppet. Yeah, me too. And in the opening sequence, the one where we see the herd walking past lava, the crew were airlifted by helicopter to the slopes of the volcano, and the producer, Simon Bell, said that they leapt from the helicopter in high wind, quote, to be abandoned on an island of rock surrounded by rivers of molten lava. And it was, quote, the most terrifying moment of my 25-year career. <laughs> I can imagine. Yep, that's how I'd feel, too. Mm -hmm. Going back to assistant producer Annie Bates, who was 
saying, you know, they wanted the volcano to be erupting. She also said that they were, quote, plagued by massive swarms of midges and flies when filming at the geothermal hot springs. Often we wore nets over our head, but it was difficult to see through them. So we came up with our own methods of dealing with the flies, but we all managed to eat a few. <laughs> Gross. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I don't think we managed to eat any flies when we were out in the Australian outback, but we had, did have a lot of flies on our eyes and mm -hmm. on our face. I was constantly swatting at my face and I felt like I was the only one doing it. <laughs> I don't know how everyone else managed. <laughs> everyone else who lived there was just used to it. There's flies like crawling on their eyeballs <laughs> without any reaction. It's I impressive. Never, yeah, I never got used to it. So going over to the Nemet formation, in another scene we see Tarkia, which I know Garrett enjoyed. It's a good, good ankylosaur. Mm -hmm. Just trying to keep cool and we hear about how the large nose helps with that. And there's a standoff with Prinocephaly and a juvenile Tarkia at a watering hole. And then another standoff between the juvenile Tarkia and the adult, or a nearby adult Tarkia. For these scenes, they went to a couple of places in Saudi Arabia, including Al Ula, which is a market city that was on the incense road, and it linked parts of Africa with the Middle East and India, and it's now home to a UNESCO World Heritage Site. And Tabuk, which is a city full of archaeological sites and desert dunes. Then we move on to a couple other dinosaurs, Karik the Raptor. This one was one of my favorites to watch. So there's a bunch of male Karik the Raptors. They're in the searing heat, but they're tending to their eggs and their nests. And it's just kind of the opposite of what penguins do in terms of like the Karitha raptor are in the heat. Penguins are doing the same thing, but in the cold mm -hmm. and <laughs> nesting in colonies and they're all kind of suffering. Yeah, together. <laughs> <laughs> but for the good of their unborn babies and eggs that are helpless and need protecting. Yes. So an oviraptor, Karitha raptor, they're protecting their eggs. And then you get a real egg thief. Because mm -hmm. we always talk about they're misunderstood. They're yeah. not egg thieves at all. They are not. They're very parental. <laughs> but we've got Kuru who comes and steals an egg. Turns out it's to feed her own young. There's a lot of that in Prehistoric Planet, which we talk about in the interview as well. Like, oh, well, circle of life. Yeah. A lot of predators grabbing babies in order to feed their babies. <laughs> yes. So for those scenes, they went to the Anza Borrego State Desert Park in California, which is, I didn't know until I looked this up, the largest state park in California with 600,000 acres of desert terrain. I went there all the time when I was in high school. Oh. When I was living in San Diego because it was like the nearest place to go for good hikes. It's a very nice park. Oh, good. Could you tell now that you know when you, when you think back about these scenes? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> I just assumed it was all somewhere far away. <laughs> <laughs> Most of that scene was in, in in the dark at night. So that's true. That didn't help. But it's also sort of, there aren't like big establishing shots for most of these places. There were for the volcanoes, but most of the other ones are sort of close in with the animals. And then the last bit, the crew was in this remote part of Saudi Arabia to film scenes of it's Nemectosaurus and Mongolian Titanosaurus and Prenocephaly walking through a canyon. It's a really cool scene to watch, and they do a really good job with the perspective. Mm -hmm. I got more Land Before Time vibes and maybe Disney's Dinosaur too, because there's three types of dinosaurs. They're all traveling together. They're clearly on a journey. Yeah. And then that's where we see the Tarbosaurus, which they come to panic the sauropods, and then they can go after the sauropods for food. And a family of Velociraptor take advantage and they go after the Prenocephaly that run away. And as a side note, the Velociraptor babies, they're pretty cute and fuzzy. And I'm pretty sure there's a Velociraptor that kicks a Prenocephaly in the face to <laughs> knock it off the cliff. <laughs> I don't remember that specific <laughs> detail. That's what, when we were rewatching it, I was like, did that Velociraptor just kick that other dinosaur in the face? <laughs> I'm pretty sure it did. <laughs> So according to producer Dominic Walter, it took weeks to find a canyon large enough to fit all of these dinosaurs. It ended up being in a, what they put as a, quote, very remote location. Yeah, because when you're in the desert, usually the canyons are really narrow, mm -hmm. really narrow and really steep. You don't get ones that are wide enough for a herd of sauropods all that often. Yes. And then I want to share, it's kind of a long quote, but it's a 
it's pretty interesting. <laughs> he said, quote, often it would be a day's drive between shots for the same sequence and in the 45 degree heat in Celsius, it's 113 degrees Fahrenheit, we sifted out all the small stones from the sand by hand. The area was covered in small bits of litter and ash from tourist campfires that needed to be cleared. There were also a lot of really small stones that would have caused havoc with adding dino assets to the plates. This was particularly problematic for foot and sand interaction. We sifted fresh sand into buckets, then we fanned it over the plate area using our hands, then a leaf blower, and finally a feather duster. Oh, man. <laughs> It would take about two hours each day to clear the area as every night more debris would be blown in. The team worked incredibly hard. And that's another example of, like we were saying last time when they're in this park with all this wildlife like lions and elephants, and normally you want to film that. But in, when you have dinosaurs in your show, you don't want any modern things. You don't want human footprints. or no. Yeah. <laughs> and you, yeah, you don't want any imperfections in the sand because it screws up your CGI. That's mm, interesting. Mm-hmm. And the canyons themselves were also apparently tricky because, according to the press notes, they were, quote, a labyrinth of passages with many dead ends and false trails. There was a real risk of getting lost, so the team employed members of a local nomadic tribe to guide them. Yeah, you don't want to get lost in there. No. Especially if it's 100-something degrees. Mm-hmm. So not the easiest locations to film in. Yeah, Badlands is an apt name for those places. Yeah. It's interesting to me that they didn't film in Mongolia at all, because we were talking about how Mongolia is pretty similar now to how it was back then. So I would have expected them to just go to Mongolia <laughs> to film it. But I guess when you're when you're shooting a documentary and you have ideas of very specific scenes, mm -hmm. like they wanted this canyon scene, if they couldn't find a canyon like that in Mongolia, yeah. then they have no choice. Well, I have no idea how many places they scoped out before they settled on the places they did. Yeah. There is also always a consideration of like the practicality of filming in places. Like I know the reason almost every island thing is filmed in Hawaii is just because there's a bunch of places in Hawaii that are really easy to get like film crews and mm -hmm. have the electrical stuff and all that. And Mongolia might not be the easiest place to do that stuff. I wouldn't know. I don't <laughs> make documentaries. <laughs> I just assume since they didn't go to Mongolia. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and in just a moment, we'll get on to our interview with Mike Gunton and Tim Walker, but first we're going to pause for a quick sponsor break. And now on to our interview with Mike and Tim, but as always, we have an extended version of this interview, so if you're a patron, make sure to check out your premium content feed. So we're joined this week by Mike Gunton, who is the executive producer and director of the BBC's Natural History Unit, and Tim Walker, the showrunner and producer of Prehistoric Planet and Prehistoric Planet 2. Thank you both very much for joining us. Thanks for having us. So first of all, I just want to say we absolutely love the show. We watched the first season, I don't know how many times, and we've already watched the second season, I think, three times. So, right. <laughs> And we plan on watching it again. Yeah. Seems like <laughs> every time we watch it, there's more to, to notice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's I, good. You know, yeah, that is good. And, and, and I think that's probably in the back of our minds whilst we're making it. You know, that's always there. But it's a multi-layered experience you know because the, the natural world was so is that was the inspiration for prehistoric planet sort of that same thing where you were thinking about how complex the ancient world was or where did the general idea of prehistoric planet come from well it, it came from trying to to make a planet earth effectively but based 66 million years ago so would it be possible to transport people to experience the world of dinosaurs or the animals that lived at that time, 66 million years, using all the techniques and all the storytelling and all the approaches that we apply today so that you get that sense that you are there. It's like the ultimate safari, that if you could step into a time machine and step out of the door and see this world and you had a camera with you, what would you see? What would you film? What would it be like? And then share that with an audience that are living here today. And that Everything, everything in terms of how we've approached it stems from that premise that that authentic experience of filming real animals that just happened to have lived 66 million years ago. And Mike coined this great phrase, which we've all adopted now. I and mean, we all, we'd like to claim it as our own, but we can't because yeah. uh, it came out of his mouth, but it's <laughs> time traveling natural history. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, that's hopefully what it feels like. In fact, you should hopefully 
not even think about the time traveling bit. You're just watching natural history. It just happens to feature cast of characters that on the whole aren't around us anymore. Yeah. yeah that is how it feels. That, that's when you've succeeded. When people, you know, when they think, oh, okay, is that going to be okay? You know, you, you're caught in the story of an individual and you want it to, you want an outcome because you're it's so invested in it. And if, if, if people feel that, then on one level, I think we've absolutely succeeded in that sort of experiential sharing that we wanted to have. have. Yeah. Definitely. And I, I think there's another layer to it that you get to in Prehistoric Planet that you don't usually see in nature documentaries, which is you often have more of a complete arc because you'll have, oh, no, I hope that animal's okay. And then it gets caught, but then it gets taken back to the predator's babies. And you're like, oh, okay. So like, I, I see more of, you know, like it's, it's not so circle bad. Of life. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Circle of life. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Cause it can be hard to film stuff like that. I'm sure compared with, if you could animate it, you might have a little more freedom. Yes and no. I mean, to be honest, the trick with this is to not have too much freedom because the danger with animation is you can do anything. Mm. And if you do, you lose the authenticity because you can't mm. do any, everything in nature, in a nature when you're filming for real. Because animals won't read scripts, don't do retakes, they will, might eat you, they might run away, you might spoil their, you might upset their life. So you have to, the very strict sort of rules of combat, so to speak, when you're filming real animals. And we absolutely replicated that filming the filming, as I call it that, because that's what it should feel like filming these animals. So I hope that when you see it, you'll recognize the same sorts of imagery and the same sorts of story development that you'll see in a, in a contemporary world. So same thing. We wouldn't dwell on any, you know, if an animal is eating another animal, we don't dwell on that when we're making planet Earth, you know, because that's not that interesting. It's a, it's the, the interesting thing was the, the relationship between those two animals before that incident happened or the backstory or what's going to happen next. You know, is that, as you said, is that predator now going to take that the success of its hunt to its babies and which one of them will get the food first? And is that because it's more dark? You know, that's the interesting stories, not the actual moment of demise of a creature. That's yeah. one of the least interesting things Just in nature. Going back to how it does feel like any other kind of documentary, especially the like the time lapse bits, like uh, you got Caritha Raptor and we're seeing the sunset and then it's nighttime and just all of that. I found, yeah, it, it was really beautiful to watch. Good. We'd taken a lot of time working with a wonderful team of producers from the Natural History Unit who have spent years and years and years in the field filming animals on every continent, every type of animal. And they know how animals behave and how you have to film them under certain circumstances. So that rationale has been applied to the creation of the, the blend of CGI and natural world that we incorporate into Prehistoric Planet. And we think about if we're filming for real, what would our conditions be like when we're following T-Rex, for example? We'd have to be a small unit. You'd have to therefore have a limited range of camera equipment. Mm -hmm. That in itself would then give you a limited range of shots. You'd have to be a distance away from them because you wouldn't want to be anywhere near a large predator. You'd have to respect their environment and you might be able to get a drone in the air occasionally, but still not very close. All of that starts to build towards the grammar of how the films look and feel as if we have really been there. Yeah. Yeah, that's so cool. I was going into it, I was imagining it sounds like prehistoric, or I would I would assume that doing a prehistoric planet would be easier than a planet Earth, but it sounds like it's even more complicated because you're still doing all that front end work of how would we shoot it? And then on top of that, you actually have to create the animals at the end of the day and make sure they're not too perfect, that they're more realistic. But also real animals just, do their thing. So, you know, if you turn up and you film an animal doing something completely bizarre, nobody's going to say, well, that's not true because we filmed it. But if there's something extraordinary that a, a dinosaur does and you represent that, people are like, really? How do you know that? And so some of that, that's a constant kind of calibration in our heads about, because the truth is animals do do the craziest things, particularly when it comes to things like sexual display and all that kind of stuff. And actually, we were quite conservative. You know, the scientific community, some of them said, well, absolutely amazing. But we were surprised. We thought you'd push it a bit harder there. <laughs> I'm, we both, I certainly am, I think we both feel, I'd rather be on that side of the, of the line that people are saying it's, it's more conservative. But I know, in, in, to the back of my mind, I've seen things in nature, which if we had put those in prehistoric planet, it would, people would have shouted fake or <laughs> ridiculous or preposterous. 
So yeah, we have to. It's it's been it's it's been a weird. We're all going to need therapy at the end of this because it's, <laughs> it's it's a really weird thing to try and get your head around trying to do this real, but it's historic and we're making up and it has to feel real, but it has to feel so real that if it doesn't, if it feels too real, people won't believe you. You know all that. Kind of stuff. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a very yeah. fine line. <laughs> yeah. Basically, I think one of the reasons why we wanted to do this was not just not just because it would be fun and also because it was a we found that the time was right in other ways, but also because the the scientific community were migrating, or we sensed they were migrating from just historically, it's what species is it? What did it look like? You know, where does it fit in the phylogenetic tree? Whereas so much now is about, well, what did it do? How did mm. it live? What was its life? Who did it live with? How did it interact with those things? And that's but and people very generously said that's partly as a result of watching our programs. That's what sparked that interest. So trying to move this this work into that space was a, a really a really important part of our life, a part of our process, our ambition. Yeah. And just kind of talking about behaviors too, because I mean, of course there are some fights and hunting and the things you'd sort of expect, but there's also a lot of playful behavior. Like I really enjoyed the scenes with Rapetosaurus in the mud bath. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, that's an interesting sequence because that that's a classic. I think that's a very good authentic sequence because if you think about that, what would we have gone to film? So we would have almost certainly gone to film the courtship behavior of a Beelzebufo. That would, you know, if, if we were discussing a sequence, we know that would be fun because they're incredible creatures and we know their courtship behavior involves this croaking and it would be funny and all that. But then what turns up? <laughs> a load of massive great sauropods. Now, if, if I, you know, if we were there filming them, we'd say, right, guys, this is the story. Let's now build this into our story. But it feels like found footage. It doesn't mm -hmm. feel like we've written that. It feels like that's that's the kind of weird stuff that happens when you're out filming. And that's why you, when you're out shooting, you go with a story in your mind, but then you sometimes have to turn it for the better. And that, I think, is a really lovely example of what could well have happened if we were out there. And that's exactly how we would have shot it. Yeah. Yeah, I love that scene. I'm glad you mentioned too the the yeah, the planning process of like who the crew is because now that I'm thinking about it those repetosaurus they're all shot from really low like you know it's the the frog crew it's not the sauropod crew that's there yeah on the baby legs yeah the little baby legs. Yeah. yeah with that you know there's a couple of drone shots uh, thrown in there because somebody quickly get a drone up in the air <laughs> but yeah the camera's down low and you know. There's no chance. And that's a once once in a in a day, maybe even in a lifetime occurrence. So those repeat source come and behave in that way. There's no time to suddenly reset. And like Mike says, you can't tell them to say, hang on Let's a minute. Back. Let's go for another <laughs> take. Yeah. Action. <laughs> but of course, also you because you would have gone there with your head thinking about Brielzi Bufo when this story turned up, you could have said, Oh, let's just tell it, let's tell the repeater store story about them going to a mud bar. But no. We've started off in the frog world, so let's continue to tell this from the frog's perspective. So this is all about how he sees mm -hmm. these repeater stores and their bizarre scale in relation to him, but also how they are a new pressure on his life. They're now the, the challenge that he's having to deal with. He didn't expect that, but it's, it's still inf informative about the challenges that a, an amorous male frog would face if he was living in that world 66 million years ago. Yeah. Yeah. And not something we'd normally think about when we're thinking about dinosaurs, like sauropods interacting with these smaller animals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, eat, they would have eaten them, some of them. I mean, they, you know, we always think of those things as being very, you know, herbivorous, but they were probably pretty omnivorous. They'd probably eat, eat anything that they'd get in their mouths, <laughs> including probably Beelze Bufo. We'll never know. Yeah, if he accidentally got squished, then mm -hmm. they're just gobbling him up. You know, he'd, he'd, he'd definitely become toad kill if one got in the wrong way. <laughs> oh, <good one. laughs> He's been waiting to get that in for about three years. <laughs> and thank you for making his day. <laughs> his year. <laughs> I know you used some new camera techniques for the filming for the, the dinosaurs, and, and VR played a role. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, um, the, the camera techniques was something that we wanted to incorporate to reflect the advancement of the, of the series. So anytime you do a sequel from a large landmark major documentary of this type, you always push the boundaries in terms of the technology you can use and the storytelling and what have you. And we've incorporated the same thought process. So 
we've shown thermal imaging in the second series to illustrate the warm-blooded nature of the dinosaurs. We see effectively starlight cameras, which are a commonly used tool now in wildlife filming to enable people to film in really low-level light conditions, nighttime especially, which can basically portray night as day. Mm. And so we've incorporated that. We show quite a lot of slow motion. Again, something that we've seen as filmmaking has progressed over the last 20 or so years, because uh, the cameras have got better and we've applied the same rationale. So we see a lot more slow-mo, which shows definition of the behavior uh, within sequences. And then we're taking the camera closer as well. And so we see a lot more close-ups of the animals, uh, which gives a really lovely emotional attachment as well. Okay. In terms of VR, we incorporated um, VR in the earlier stage of the process. So having worked out what stories we're going to tell, we then go through a process uh, which sees us create what we call an animatic, which is a moving storyboard of each sequence, which is drawn for us by artists. And then we take that and turn it into a virtual world where an environment is created and fed into a VR system, which then the camera operators can enter and move around and, and interact in that space with the animals. I've got to ask you a question quickly. So in the Badlands episode, mm -hmm. the little baby podlet, little baby isosaur who falls down, something happens to that little baby, which probably means it's not going to make it. What did you think at that moment? Oh, I, I've got a new view on babies since having one. <laughs> 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 and okay. saur sauropods are Sabrina's favorite dinosaurs, yeah. too. So. <laughs> so I did have a reaction, but... <laughs> but I'll, I'll tell you, I did a show a while back about penguins, and, the, and in that in that film, the, some penguins fell into this crevice, and we, we filmed it. Anyway, in, in, we did a making of at the end of the, of the show about how we went and rescued the penguins. Oh. Uh, in a way, we, we didn't actually reach in and grab them, but we made it, we made it, we helped them escape from a certain death cause a huge Ferrari, you know, Oh, should you be interfering? Is this, you know, are you like war correspondent you know, massive thing? And I just said all along, of course, of course you would rescue them. Of course you would do that. So the question I was, you know, what I'm hoping is that when people watch that film, that our, our, our prehistoric planet, that episode, they're going to say, did you rescue them? <laughs> did you rescue the Because if they think that, then I think we've absolutely, Got it right. And of course, the answer will be, yeah, of course we did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I could see that being a, a question that, that people think of. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Sabrina, have you, what, what do you think of the, the depiction of the sauropods across the series? Oh, Is they your favorite dinosaur? Yes, I love them. All, oh, my gosh. Uh, <laughs> they're actually, the reason why I think Tim's asking is they're really difficult. They were the hardest ones to get right. Why is that? The, I mean, the, the anatomy of those sauropods is quite unusual. And basically, when you try to make them in a computer, they start to not look real mm. because the anatomy is so peculiar. And then when they start to move, they start to look very peculiar as well because the physics don't seem to align with, uh, with what we accept as locomotion and, and then the associated movement with locomotion as well. When an animal walks along, its legs aren't the only things that are moving. Other aspects of it, although it maintains stability, <laughs> other parts of it move as well. And they were very, very tricky to get right. And in fact, we changed the gate between Series 1 and Series 2 due to some of the work yeah. we were doing. And we worked with world-renowned locomotion experts, the Royal Veterinary College in London, who guide us on, on how the animals work. But when you're then recreating it in computers, sometimes what is real mm -hmm. in terms of the anatomy, the skeleton, the musculature doesn't portray very well on screen. And then, then they also throw up another problem, which is when you're doing the lighting and um, the, what's called the comp, comping the animals into the background, mm -hmm. they're very hard to get right because of the texture of the skin and their scale. It's <laughs> yeah. very, very challenging to, to get them to look real. So to hear that people are liking them is really music to our ears oh, you know, yes. because you know, people work very hard on getting them right. And the, the, the animation team, the VFX team, will be delighted to know that 
people loving them as well. Oh, so. definitely. And and all the details too on like the coloring and just details on the skin and everything. I'll have to go back and watch more closely how they're walking yeah. next time. <laughs> so how did it, what was the specific change with the gait that you made? I mean, to be honest, it's pretty subtle. Okay. And it was, yeah. it, I mean, Sorry. it's an, it's an argument about mu- where certain muscles might be attached. To, uh, it's I, I, my recollection is to do with hip. You know, you know how the tail and the tail musculature works with the hips and where the tail swinging is. I, I once, uh, I thought it'd be quite fun to do a little behind the scenes of of a conversation between three of our experts talking about the musculature, a piece of musculature on a T Rex skull. It's quite an important one in terms of how they the jaw operates. So I got my iPhone out and I started filming a little video of them chatting on this phone. And because I thought, well, yeah, you know, a couple of minutes. After about five minutes, they were still going. And after about 50 minutes, my arms were beginning to end. And after 30 <laughs> minutes, I just got to say, well, I'm not getting it. And that was just one muscle that was being discussed. <laughs> so that is the, and this was a transatlantic yeah. thought. Was, somebody was in LA or in New York, I can't remember where, somebody in America, somebody in Switzerland, somebody in the UK. Yeah. It was, the scholarship, you know, we've took, one of the things, we're very, obviously very proud of it as, as a piece of television and the entertainment and the, and all the all those things that we want to deliver, but I think we're very we intended it, hoped it would have this other level, and in, and I'm very pleased that there is this really really high level of scholarship. I've worked on so many shows which I've never had that the the underpinning because you have to because you have to make decisions about things as minute as that muscle or the or the, or the eyelashes or how a little twitch might happen. You have to make those decisions so far upstream because you can't go back you can't you can't undo it once you get what well, you can it's mind-blowingly complicated and expensive <laughs> so to do that to be sure of that you have to ask difficult questions up front because you have to make your decisions at david atom who you know is what who's our original and there's always a big force in these things who's you know veracity and truth and accuracy and authenticity are so important to him and he was talking about this saying was well, one of the things he enjoyed hearing how those decisions were made and how how you sort of it's a it's a maximum parsimony you whatever the expression is you know you get rid of all the things that it can't be and then it must be this and that that that's all these little threads to give you that that come to that conclusion yeah it was uh, it's fascinating it i mean the the hard work shows and it's gorgeous and it's it's gonna it's well it already is one of those maybe like once in a generation, you get these amazing documentaries that affect people or influence people for decades mm-hmm. or for the rest of their lives. And even a lot of our listeners, like during the pandemic, we would do watch parties and there'd be documentaries and people were like, I watched these as a kid and I, I rewatch them all the time. And Prehistoric Planet, I think, is definitely one of those now. Yes. Yeah, great. Yeah, great. We, are, we, we know that there was, a, there was an effect caused by what with dinosaurs and Jurassic Park, you know, the paleo effect, people getting interested in, in dinosaurs again, mm-hmm. prehistoric world, and uh, even getting into studying it. And fingers crossed that this will do the same as well, you yeah. know, 25 to 30 years on from that. Definitely. It's wonderful. Yeah, you want it to be a kind of part of that pantheon of, you know, this is the, this is the kind of, we want this to people to say, if you want reference, not just in television, but in academic reference. What was it? What was the thinking? What do we think the world of dinosaurs was like? What What was the most accurate representation, as we thought of it in 2023, of this world? Go to this series because that's the one. That if you know if, if that if that's if it's in the Smithsonian. I mean, I'm joking really, but you know what I mean. If it has that kind of, I don't know what the word is. I can't think what the word is, but that kind of touchstone that people go to it to say that's what it should look like. Then I think we'll be super pleased. Yeah. yeah. Legacy. That legacy. The legacy. legacy. Thank you. That's a yeah. good word. Yes. Legacy, yeah. I yeah. think it does. I think it will. Yeah. But thank you so much for chatting with us and giving us a little more insight into the series. We again we are huge fans. Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yeah. Oh no. It's a pleasure. pleasure. It's lovely to talk. Thanks, guys. Thank you so much, Mike and Tim and the whole team that scheduled everything so we were able to have this interview. It was really cool to be able to talk to the people who made Prehistoric Planet too. Yeah. And in just a moment, Sabrina's going to get into a new sauropod dinosaur of the day, Isisaurus. But first, we're going to pause for one last sponsor break. And now onto the dinosaur of the day, Isisaurus. As we mentioned, it appears in the second episode of Prehistoric Planet 2. 
It was a titanosaur that lived in the late Cretaceous in what is now India and Pakistan, in the Lameda Formation and Pab Formation, which were about the same age. Reconstructions make it look kind of hunched over, with a short neck for a sauropod, and with very long legs. It did seem sort of short-necked in the depictions of yeah. prehistoric planet. But then, of course, being a sauropod, it is fairly large. It's got the long tail, walked on four legs, and it's got that proportionally small, elongated skull. In prehistoric planet's version, it looked pretty stout to me. Yeah, especially the babies. Yeah. Isisaurus was medium-sized. It was estimated to be about 59 feet or 18 meters long and weighed 15 metric tons. It's humerus, the arm bone, was about 58 inches or 148 centimeters long. So was that almost five feet? Pretty long. That is. And back in 2009, Sauropod Vertebra Picture of the Week posted that the reconstruction of Isisaurus was, quote, weird as heck. <laughs> they said that there's conflicting reconstructions that are also weird. Both reconstructions are based on data from the original paper that describes it, but one reconstruction is based on the scale bars in the figures in the paper, and another one is from measurements written in the paper. So apparently they don't agree very well. No, and the sauropod vertebrate picture of the week, they did their reconstruction based on the measurements in the paper. Oh, really? I would have thought the picture. I think they, the reason was that it seemed that the measurements in the paper might be more accurate, but they ended with advocating for measuring the skeleton again to determine if it's the scale bars or the published measurements that are the accurate numbers. Oh, I see. Yeah. For some reason, scale bar is probably different than like an actual scale. I was imagining in the picture, mm. you know, like how you can have a picture of the actual scale in it, but this is probably a bar that was added after the fact. Could be. Which you're probably right, might be a little more prone to error. They also wrote, quote, we know the icy source must have been pretty darn weird because its cervicals are so short. Meaning it's neck vertebrae. Yep. So it's got some interesting things going on. The type species is Isisaurus colberti. Originally, it was thought to be Titanosaurus colberti. It was named Titanosaurus colberti in 1997 by Sohan Laljane and Saswati Bandiopadhyay. The species name is in honor of Edwin Colbert, who's, quote, the foremost exponent of dinosaurs. The authors in 97 wrote, quote, the earliest record of titanosaurids anywhere in the world was established in India in 1877, which I wanted to quote because for whatever reason, I didn't know that before I read this paper, yeah. but titanosaurus was found in the Lometa formation and that's below the Deccan traps. Titanosaurus is from India. Yes. Huh. What do you know? Yeah. When I hear titanosaur, I think Argentina, not India. Yeah, the group titanosaurs, but same. <laughs> I guess that's what happens, though. We're, we haven't done titanosaurus as a dinosaur of the day yet. So. We haven't? No. Oh, yeah. Weird. It is. <laughs> anyway, it was only fragments that were found, but that was enough at the time to name titanosaurus. I actually don't know if I even knew titanosaurus was an, <laughs> an animal. Like I knew Titanosaurus, but mm -hmm. I did I don't know if I knew Titanosaurus. Oh, I did at least know about Titanosaurus, but I didn't know Anything it was about in, it. <laughs> 1877. That's amazing. Yeah. Anyway, we're talking about Isisaurus, okay. and those fossils were collected between 1984 and 1986. They found a well-preserved, partly articulated skeleton of 65 bones. Hmm. Yeah, and included vertebrae, ribs, parts of the shoulder, left arm, pelvis but it was missing a skull and hind limb and foot bones, possibly due to erosion. Okay. Yeah, because the way they depicted it, they sort of have it in more of like a brachiosaurus type posture mm -hmm. with the longer front arms than hind limbs. And that's probably because that humerus is so long. But without the hind limbs, it's always a little bit speculative. Although if they have the hips, sometimes you can get the angle of the back a little bit from that, so that can help. That's true. With these fossils, since it was so articulated, they think it was probably buried close to where it died. Mm, that this, helps too with the posture. It does. Isisaurus has differences in the tail vertebrae from other titanosaur species, including some more slightly curved surfaces. And there's some differences in the shoulder and the arm bones. So in 2003, Jeffrey Wilson and Paul Upchurch renamed this specimen to Isisaurus colberti. They reevaluated all titanosaur species and found only five of them to be valid. And they actually found the type species of Titanosaurus indicus to be invalid. So we've got Isisaurus colberti, and the genus name means icy lizard. 
or ISI lizard. Yes, because the name is in honor of the Indian Statistical Institute, which, quote, houses India's foremost collection of Mesozoic fossil vertebrates and whose scholars discovered and described the holotype skeleton. Yeah, and that's one of those where it's like, how do you pronounce it? It's an it's an abbreviation. Yep. <laughs> how do you pronounce ISI? We can't call it ISI-saurus. That would be crazy. <laughs> but in, in prehistoric planet, they go with IC-saurus, so that's what we're doing. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like that they say I at the beginning of it since it's I-S-I. Yeah, it was helpful. Thank mm-hmm. you, David Attenborough. Mm-hmm. <laughs> now, other sauropods that were found in what's now India include, obviously, titanosaurs, multiple species, fewer as of 2003 than before, but there's still mm-hmm. multiple ones, and Janosaurus. And Isosaurus lived alongside Janosaurus. In 2011, Jeffrey Wilson, Paul Barrett, and Matthew Carano referred a, quote, nearly complete, relatively undeformed brain case, end quote, to Isosaurus. Nice. Yeah, and that brain case was found in Pakistan. They said that there hadn't been any systematic comparison between sauropods found in both the Pab and Lametta formations, and, quote, there remains a strong possibility that more of the remains collected from the Pab formation it will be referable to Isosaurus and Janosaurus, end quote. It's also possible there's other Titanosaur species there. They said that Janosaurus and Isosaurus don't seem to be closely related and that they, quote, represent distinct Titanosaur lineages. Oh, cool. Yeah, that's always interesting when they live alongside each other, but they're pretty different. Mm-hmm. There's some coprolites that are thought to have come from Isosaurus, and they contain fungus. And that fungus is known to infect tree leaves and cause leaf spot and red rot. Which, when I looked up leaf spot and red rot, they look how they sound. <laughs> One's a spot on a leaf and the other is a red rotting yep. thing. <laughs> <laughs> now, if those coprolites belong to Isosaurus, it means Isosaurus ate a variety of different tree leaves and probably was a high browser like camels and giraffes today. Based on that fungus, Isosaurus probably lived in a tropical to subtropical climate. That's where fungus likes to grow. Mm -hmm. Now, other dinosaurs found around the same time and place as Isosaurus include abelosaurs like Indosuchus and Rajasaurus. And other animals that were around at the same time and place include fish, shrimp, gastropods, turtles, and crocodiles. Because they weren't just in volcanoes. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And our fun fact of the day is that the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event, one of the largest extinction events in Earth's history, was likely caused by volcanic eruptions similar to those that formed the Deccan Traps. Mm. I think that's one of the reasons why there's an argument or a hypothesis that the Deccan Traps contributed more to the demise of dinosaurs. Yeah, and you covered an article a little while back where you were talking about how throughout basically the Mesozoic and Cenozoic, a lot of the extinction events seem to line up with different volcanism. Mm -hmm. So there's this sort of correlation there, but there's so much volcanism all the time (laughs) that it's it's not that surprising that some of them would line up. I think it was like three or four out of five of these major extinction events, but there are literally dozens of major volcanic eruptions. So yeah, it's difficult. But Part of the reason I bring it up is because for a long time, there was a large group of scientists that thought volcanism both started and ended the dinosaur era, meaning the Jurassic to the Cretaceous. And the reason I say the dinosaur era is the Jurassic to the Cretaceous is because dinosaurs really got going after the Triassic-Jurassic extinction event. They were around in the Triassic, but it wasn't really like their time Mm -hmm. the way it was starting in the Jurassic. Not until those volcanoes got to their... (laughs) the other animals. (laughs) Yeah, wiped out the other stuff. (laughs) Now pretty much everyone agrees that the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction was caused by the Chicxulub impact and not by the Deccan Traps volcanism, although again, some people think the Deccan Traps may have contributed. But the leading theory is that the Triassic-Jurassic flood basalt, which is called the Central Atlantic Magmatic Province or CAMP, (laughs) <laughs> camp <laughs> is what caused the triassic jurassic extinction event camp sounds innocuous it does <laughs> they're just going to camp <laughs> camp is an enormous area it's about 11 million square kilometers 
which is an area about 10% larger than Canada, which is obviously way bigger than the Deccan Traps. Mm -hmm. The camp formed as North America, South America, Africa, and Europe split apart from Pangaea, and a lot of magma was released in those four continents and what is now the middle of the North Atlantic Ocean. Uranium lead dating, published in 2013 by Blackburn and others, put the date right on the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. Up till that point, there was some debate about how well it lined up with the boundary. And when they did their research, they were like, it's exactly there. It's sort of like when they found the Chicxulub impactor site and did the dating on it. And they were like, oh, that's that's right there. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so the camp eruptions happened right about 201 million years ago. That's the boundary between the Triassic and Jurassic. And it lasted for about 600,000 years. A study by Capriolo and others from last year looked at how much CO2 would have been released by the camp eruptions. And they found that enough CO2 was released that it could have raised the temperature of the atmosphere by up to five degrees Celsius or nine degrees Fahrenheit. Wow. Which is some extreme warming. Us humans are worried if we can handle a temperature change of less than half that magnitude mm -hmm. because it would mess us up and our food up. So you can imagine back in the Triassic, Jurassic, doubling that amount would mess up all sorts of food webs as well. That increase in CO2 would also drop oceanic pH by about 0.2 which doesn't sound like much, but animals with shells and exoskeletons in the ocean can be really sensitive to more acidic water, and that acidification alone could have caused huge problems in the Triassic Oceans even without the temperature change. So this means that the camp eruptions probably caused the end Triassic extinction, which wiped out tons of entire animal families that were doing really well in the Triassic, including lots of archosaurs, it, like Adasaurs and other really cool Pseudosuchians. The only archosaur groups to survive were dinosaurs, pterosaurs, and crocodilomorphs. They're the ones that we always talk about because they also survived the KPG boundary mm -hmm. other than pterosaurs. So we're very familiar with those groups. But yeah, the Triassic-Jurassic boundary was very rough, probably caused by volcanism. So you could see why people look at the Deccan traps and think, well, did they have an impact on this too? I just find it really interesting too that the camp eruptions are linked to global warming, whereas the Deccan traps they think might have released a bunch of sulfur dioxide and cooled the earth. But then other people are like, no, they released carbon dioxide and warmed. There was just more cooling happening mm. and it was offset. So the Deccan traps are more complicated for sure, to figure out. Hard to know about something that happened so long ago. Yeah, and when there was a huge meteor impact at the same time. Mm -hmm. And on that lovely note, <laughs> what a way to end the show. <laughs> well, I see the camp eruptions as a sort of positive thing because in addition, the mammals survived it yep. and had an increased presence in the Jurassic than they did in the Triassic. So it sort of set up both the dinosaurs and mammals on a good path forward. <laughs> <laughs> well done, mammals. Thanks. And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thank you for listening. Stay tuned. Next week, we'll be covering dinosaurs and other animals in the swamps for Prehistoric Planet 2, Episode 3. And if you want even more dinosaur goodness in your life, then sign up for our newsletter. That's at inodino.com. Thanks again, and until next time. Good day.